But are you there, hon? Oh, here he comes. He's so funny, doesn't want to be seen. And gosh, no. shirt. might scare somebody. <laughs> yeah, I got a different shirt on and everything. Oh, oh. nice. Blue for blue eyes. <laughs> yeah. I had one of those, what is it? The this yeah, Beater. tank top thing. Yeah. <laughs> Not appropriate for uh, prime time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, brother. Hi, how are you? Good. You're good. looking good. Yes, he is. Hi, Heidi. Hi. Hi. Uh, we we miss you coming there. Yeah. You, you need to come up and visit again. Yeah, you do. We absolutely do have to come back up there. Yeah. So hey, listen, I, the good news and bad news is you're gainfully unemployed. So it's a great time to come <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, free vacation. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's too funny. <laughs> and we certainly missed you, Carol. Yeah. Uh, I missed you guys too. Yeah. We talked about There's you. There's always uh, next Sunday, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're always uh, praying his way to the East Coast for a visit. I heard, yeah. Down, you you got to come out. He's been wanting to get here forever. I'll put you on one of these tractors and you help mow some more. <laughs> yeah, or not. <laughs> I, had a, I had a tractor business uh, one oh. time. I had a full size Kubota, so I'd love that. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, uh, I'm a green and yellow guy. Well, we're going to have to, you know, let you get you to stay for several weeks. <laughs> let you work. No, just kidding. You come here and get refreshed and revived. We'd love to have you. So, honey, you want to open us up? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time that we can gather, Lord, brothers and sisters. And Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you gave us. And and Lord, uh, also for the day of rest this afternoon mm -hmm. after the service, Lord, it's so refreshing to to just uh, to just rest our weary bones. Lord, we thank you for this message that you've put on Gracie's heart. Lord, we just pray that you would anoint each word, Holy Spirit, and teach us what you would have us to learn. Lord, we pray for every heart that will listen to this recording afterwards, Lord, in weeks and months to come. God, we just uh, know that your word will not return void. And we just thank you for this message that uh, that uh, um, you put on Gracie's heart tonight. And we look forward to, to learning what you have for us tonight. Lord, we just lift up everybody on this call for, and that you would bless each one, Lord. And we ask all these things in your mighty name, dear Jesus. Amen. Amen. I got you. You can go back to his comfort zone now. You can get back your white beater shirt on. Nobody will know the difference, honey. Just <laughs> throw the red. <laughs> Poor Doug. <laughs> Poor Doug. He got stuck with me and my uh, wicked humor. Uh, so we have been uh, praying with everything within us, you know, at the well. Because we want the Lord to give us everything he's got to give. We want to see a powerful movement of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that that in part is why he, uh, you know, just keeps speaking to my heart about truth. I mean, we talk about truth all the time. He's the way, the truth, right? Uh, but, you know, I think we got to do some house cleaning is what I'm saying. If we really want the full uh, movement of the Spirit of God, there's some stuff that we just kind of shuffle past and we don't really necessarily think about them. Maybe we do and we just blow them off or maybe we don't see things for what they really are. So tonight we're going to be looking at a biggie and that biggie is, uh, you know, forgiveness. And so first, you know, of course, as was the case with many things, we look at what something isn't. But I can tell you that it's the truth that will set you free. And that's why it's so important for us to look at it. Matthew 6, 12 says, forgive us our trespasses, which is our sin, right? As we forgive those who trespass against us. So in other words, it's basically saying, listen, the way you do it, the way you dish it out, is where you're going to get it. So forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's a matter of, Lord, please forgive my sin, my wrong, my offense. And we need to be asking the same thing, you know, as we search our own hearts for uh, to forgive someone else. It's not, it's certainly not an easy thing. But, you know, when you're forgiven, uh, you experience joy. We know about the cross, the blood of Jesus. We know that we've been forgiven. And uh, you know what, guys? <laughs> Mute me out. Hold Please. on one second. I'm going on and um, 
you two out? Yeah, please. I can't, I can't figure out how to do it, man. And there's background noise. We got to go back anyway because, um, okay, got everybody. Okay, because I noticed that my screen wasn't showing here. So let me try to skim. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes? Okay. So we know about the cross. We know that when we're forgiven, we experience uh, that joy, right? We, we know that it, we, we can't lose our salvation. We cling to it. We're so grateful for the cross. But when we refuse to confess uh, wrongdoing, we suffer. And David talked about that best put in uh, Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those uh, whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yet what joy for those who record uh, the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long, day and night. Your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in a summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. And I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me and my guilt is gone. So, uh, you know, when, when we're forgiven, uh, obviously we do feel joyful, right? When we carry that stuff around, whether it's conscious or subconscious, it, it, we're going to suffer for it. And so it's not a good thing uh, from any stretch, right? It, it isn't. So, you know, when we're forgiven, we experience joy. And, you know, we get the forgiveness. There are two Greek words for that word, forgiveness here. Uh, well, I'm going to botch them up. <laughs> I hope no Bible scholar ever catches it, finds it way here. One uh, is charidizomai, and the other is alfini. And so the word charidizomai comes from the Greek word charis, which means grace. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the grace to forgive, right? Alfimi means to, uh, to loose or to let go. So there's two very different things, but very interesting, isn't it? Depends on how they're used in the Bible in terms of the context. Luke 7, 40 actually uses both translations here. And so we read in 41, a certain money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 an hour and the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled or, you know, he, he, he forgave that, right? He, he, he had the grace to let it go. Uh, for both of them, he just let it go, and and the, the grace, and neither of them, um, he excuse me, says now which of them will love him more, and Simon answered the one I suppose for whom you canceled or again, uh, you know forgave gave grace right the larger debt, and he said to him you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. And, and that's when they use Alfini came in, and that meant it's gone. Let it go, let it go, right? And he says, so there, there are many. I can tell you, I'm a wretch. In the past, I had many, right? So there are many forgiven, and 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 they're just let go. For she loved much, but he who has forgiven or let it go little loves little. So it's a sign of of not loving big enough when we don't let go, right? So he, uh, see, who forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, "Your sins are forgiven." Afini, those who were set who were at the table with him began to say to among themselves, "Who is this that can forgive sins?" And he said to the woman, "Your faith has uh, saved you. And go in peace." So we see both translations for that word forgiveness here in Luke, and, and it can go both ways. What I love about uh, the the way God uses these two words is that they describe, you know, magnificently, really the the nature, human nature, if you will, and that whole process of forgiveness. When we forgive, we have to cancel the debt that we believe somebody else owes us. They hurt us, they wronged us, they lied to us, they broke our hearts, they stole from us, whatever it is, right? We, we need to cancel that debt that we believe somebody owes us. And it, it's interesting, human nature, how we want his grace and we want him to let go. We believe he died on the cross, everything was forgiven, and yet we hold on, who do we think we are? That we hold on to an offense as like a pit bull, right? Just, just, uh, just hanging on and not letting go. We don't say, uh, you know, that person owes me an apology. You know, uh, you know, in our hearts, we may think we deserve better treatment. Isn't that what a 
uh, what happens when somebody uh, does something, it's an offense. In other words, we, we, we think we deserve better and we probably do, right? But it's, we, we, we think that person owes us an apology. According to Ephesians 4.32, we are to forgive others as God has forgiven us. In other words, forgiveness doesn't have any strings attached. He didn't say, if you do this, if you do that, jump through this hoop, that hoop. He died for all of it, right? And uh, and they don't owe us anything. So when we forgive someone with the idea of that uh, feeny, which is to let it go, we let it go. We let it loose. When we forgive, it's gone, right? Uh, we don't bring it up again. We don't just continue, like, push the replay button. Well, remember 22 years ago when you did that? We don't bring it up again and we don't let it take over our hearts. And so it's important that we start facing these things and looking at them, how they work within the soul, even if they're not in the forefront of our mind. Again, in Ephesians 4, 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. It doesn't say forgive the nice people, forgive the people that don't hurt your feelings, forgive the people that you like. No, it says forgive each other, just as Christ forgave you. So we need to be mirroring that to the extent possible with everything within us in, in how to forgive, right? And we've been whitewashing this, guys. We've been putting it just somewhere and thinking, well, we've got the grace that, you know, he died for our sins. And, 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 and if you knew what that person did to me, we excuse it. We got to knock it off. You want everything God has for you. You've got to extend forgiveness to other people. So let's start looking at what forgiveness is not before we hammer in the forgiveness that we need to be, you know, uh, definitely adopting into our lives. So what it, what it's not? Well, first of all, forgiveness is not excusing or minimizing something that, you know, you got your heart all welled up with pain. It's not like to downplay it. Uh, it it's, it's not overlooking a wrong. Well, I'll just let it go. Just let it go. Overlook it. I didn't think they really meant that. You know, it's, it's not that. It's not taking the blame for somebody else's stuff, that's for sure. And it's definitely not sweeping it under the carpet. You see, it doesn't go away unless we truly forgive of it. So I was uh, sharing at the well this morning. Uh, I don't need to go into long details because we'd be here for weeks. But the Reader's Digest version is that, you know, my marriage to my, uh, my the father of my children, you know, was bad and, you know, suffering and I wanted out and uh, these uh, people in my prayer group, my excuse me, my Bible study group in my home uh, convinced me to go to a counseling session with them. I was so far gone. I didn't want to go there. Right. But, you know, there had been something I learned to suppress things. And some of you may understand what I'm talking about. But sometimes if you have a lot of uh, you know drama or, or pain in your childhood, you just learn to put it somewhere. I don't know where it goes, but but we just learn to put it somewhere. And some people with uh, difficult childhoods, you know, it makes them bitter and they lash out and maybe they repeat the same patterns. And some people learn to suppress. So I suppress. So I was unhappy, but there were some big things that, uh, you know, probably I'd have committed homicide if I thought about it. I just suppressed them. So we go to this counseling session and the counselor says, you know, usually uh, when people come to this point, it's usually just one or two things you, you can identify as a, the moment that you felt, you know, wronged or whatever. And frankly, usually it isn't as big as you think it is. So I'm going to give each one of you a chance. Well, this one super big offense just came, it just came out. I, I, I wasn't thinking it. It, it still was stored inside of me, and there's no doubt it prevented me from healing any kind of relationship, right? It was in there, and so I, I said it very calmly. It just, you know, very matter-of-factly. It didn't come out with emotion. It didn't come out with finger-pointing. It just came out, the short version of what happened, and the two elders that were there, they were kind of wanted to sit in to be sure, you know, whatever. I don't even know. It was legalism at its best, but uh, the bottom line is they teared up and the and the counselor left him and, and, and said that we needed to be separated based on that. But that's not my point. My point is I had swept it under the carpet, suppressed it. It was somewhere I had not forgiven it. Right. I had just learned to go on from it. That That's not forgiveness. Just because you can learn to survive some wrong doesn't mean you forgive him. Forgiveness is not forgetting. So we hear that. No, for, forget about it. I'm not going to forgive and forget what they did to me. And so we think that, you know, it, it, that we'd have to forget it. I'm not going to. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. OK, because listen, if we forgot every bad thing that ever happened, we would never learn anything. We'd be like a dog returning to its vomit. You know, we've got to learn from things that we go through in life. And so forgiveness 
forgiveness is not just forgetting about it. Although uh, when you forgive, it rarely comes to mind, right? Uh, it's not a forgive and forget. So some people uh, fight forgiving because they're like, I'm not going to forget that. Well, you, you may not be called to forget that, but that's not what it is. Forgiveness is not waiting for an apology. They owe me an apology. They need to make it right. They know what they did to me. If Jesus didn't wait for the Pharisees to apologize, right? And, and and we're not supposed to wait for that either. The fact that they don't apologize doesn't let us off the hook for forgiving them. It, we, we got our own deal. We can't base our life and our salvation and our future with the king of all kings based on how they react or what they do or what they didn't do to make it right. So it's not waiting for an apology. We need to be called to uh, to be committed to forgiving them no matter what no strings attached, right? And so it, it's tough. Forgiveness is not necessarily reconciliation, although sometimes we see it. It takes two people to reconcile something. I've got a, another big thing in my family. I would, you know, I miss these relationships, right? Uh, it, but there's no unforgiveness there. The, the, it, the things are not sitting uh, in a bad place, so to speak, but there hasn't been reconciliation because it takes two. Reconciliation requires repentance on both sides, but you, but you can forgive without ever experience that reconciliation, which is what I'm referring to in my life. The good news is forgiveness often does ultimately lead to reconciliation because your heart is softened again. There's not a shell around it. There's not this thing. I'm not going to let you do that to me again. You know, you're supposed to, you know, 70 times seven, forgive, right? Turn the other cheek. So uh, it, it's not necessarily going to be reconciliation. Somebody asked uh, this morning, well, you know, do you have to uh, go to that person? Well, that's a whole different topic for a different day. You know, uh, technically, like Matthew 18, if somebody wrongs you, you do. But, you know, I did a lot when I went through studying the strongholds. I went through a lot of forgiving things for my mother who had already passed away. I had to learn to forgive some things that I was holding against her, even though she wasn't even here anymore. I mean, this is serious business, guys, where it could just rest inside your soul and prohibit you from having the fullness that God has for you. So um, it, it's not necessarily reconciliation. It won't change the past. It is what it is, guys. We get wronged or whatever it is. It is done. It's in the past. You can't live in the past or you'll dictate the future, right? So it doesn't change the past, but it can definitely enlarge or change your future. For me, when I learned this whole process of letting it go, it was like just, gosh, it was just like sacks of rocks I've been carrying around just to let it go. It'll make you right with Christ. There's no doubt about it. You guys know my story. You know, I got to a point in my life uh, with one situation of unforgiveness that I was festering with hate. I mean, I, it, I, I don't say it to be funny. I, you know, I really truly thought of ways of killing this person. I was consumed with hate as a Christian. And boy, did God get my attention. Uh, uh, needless to say, I did go on to forgive that person uh, from the bottom of my heart, right? Would I forget that? And and and, and no, I never forget that because I never want to repeat that, right? But, you know, I have forgiven. It, it, it is where I began to heal. See, when you harbor unforgiveness, it's not hurting them. That person had no idea that I felt what I was feeling, right? It was hurting myself. So it doesn't change the past. You will never change the past. It's done. So whatever's back there that causes you pain, you need to forgive it. Forgiveness isn't an option. It's a command. It's not like we can sit back uh, the way many of people have done in the last, I don't know, 20 years, maybe. Uh, you know, it, 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 we sit back and excuse things. The, for, the unforgiveness will get in the way of your relationship with Jesus. Unforgiveness could mean that you don't find your way to, to his arms at all. And so it's a big deal. It's not an option. It's a command. And, you know, if we have a desire to fulfill his will, we can forgive. We have been forgiven, haven't we? Colossians 4, uh, excuse me, 2.13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, everything you ever did, guys. Uh, uh, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, 
having nailed it to the cross. It was nailed. It was finished, right? And having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So we have been forgiven. Uh, when it, Remember when we were studying uh, the cross and he said, it is finished. It's the same word that was used when, when debt was paid off, right? At fulfillment, when an employee had completed a job, it's finished, it's finished. It's finished. But you know, how can we sit back and, and, and just embrace all this wonderful um, nature of our uh, our salvation, right? The fact that we have forgiveness. I don't know how big your trespasses were, but my mine make a toast, girl. And know that you're completely forgiven. Oh, my goodness. You know, how can we possibly say, well, that was good. I probably deserve to be forgiven. But that one doesn't for deserve my forgiveness. Who do you think you are? We have got to let it go if we want that entire relationship he has for us. We, again, we've been forgiven. Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a, a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also must do. It's not a, a try to forgive. It's not, not a, a, a light warning here. It's a command. We have must forgive if we want his forgiveness. Forgiveness will restore broken relationships. No doubt about that. Genesis 50, 17 is where uh, it's talking about Joseph. You remember what Joseph's uh, brother said to him? I mean, you talk about hate. They, you know, they threw him into a pit. They took, put animal blood on his, on his coat and took him back to the daddy and let him think he was dead. Oh my goodness. But, but Joseph healed through the process and they didn't heal till they found Joseph again. He says, thus she shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers in their sin. For they did evil to you. Now, please forgive the trespass of all the servants of God, of your father. So they're going in and saying, we, but, you know, please forgive us for what we did to you, Joseph. And Joseph wept when they spoke. See, he'd already forgiven. His, his heart wasn't hard. He'd already forgiven them. And he had tremendous success, of course. But uh, the biggest victory there was he could see how God put him in a place of leadership so he could actually help his family, feed his hungry uh, brothers and father. He, he, God brought that victory to him because he didn't have a harbored heart. Do you want that victory in your life? Do you want to be free of all that stuff? Forgiveness is a path to love. In Luke 7, 47, it says, therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, right, that we just read about, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And so it, it's a path to love. If, you know, if when you think about it, I said this recently, we're actually studying uh, strongholds. And I said, you know, when you think about it, every marriage breaks because of the lack of forgiveness. I mean, that's the bottom line, whatever it is, or it, it however, me included, right, with that mess I had, uh, it really all comes down to forgiveness. So we choose to forgive or we don't forgive. And so, you know, and I'm not saying that every marriage should stick. We get ahead of God and <laughs> my goodness, we can make all kinds of train wrecks. But I am saying that, you know, uh, it's a path to love, to be free, you know, to be able to forgive like that. You can't have a relationship unless you're willing to forgive. Forgiveness precedes healing. You know, we see that in Luke 5, 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of uh, Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed, of, uh, excuse me, brought on a bed, a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst of Jesus. You talking about beautiful. That's love, by the way. That your friends would, they, they, they believe so wholeheartedly that if we could just get our friend in the presence of Jesus, he'll be healed. And they were right, right? Um, but it precedes healing. And so we have to, if we want healing of any kind in our life, my goodness, we have to um, be willing to do that. When he saw their faith, he said to them, man, your sins are forgiven you. When he saw the faith of these friends that would carry their brother in there and lower them down the roof of somebody's house, right? And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, who are you reasoning in your heart? Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, 
take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, uh, took up what he had been lying on and departed with his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. So it precedes healing. Okay. Uh, well, again, that's not just physical healing. It's spiritual healing, emotional, healing, whatever kind of healing, right? It precedes it. You can't walk around with a bunch of garbage in your heart. Even again, even if it's subconscious until this very moment, right? Or when you pray about it later, you, you can't walk around with that mess, you know, and be healed. You can't do it. The cross is all about forgiveness. That's a hundred percent. The story of the cross is forgiveness. And yet we harbor things against somebody and somebody you know, did some horrible thing to us. You know, um, there are a couple of things that came to mind as I was preparing this. And one thing is that uh, we just went, uh, Doug and myself, we just went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania for to celebrate his birthday. And I love to go around the Amish people. It's just so, it's a beautiful life. And you look at it, looking in, right? It's beautiful. But I can't help but think, when I think about Lancaster, I think about that schoolhouse, you know, that was shot down a crazy guy, milk delivery guy, uh, that went in and killed all those little kids in the, in the Amish school. It was heart wrenching. But, you know, it was uh, less than 48 hours later. Um, the, the, you know, people went to the Amish people, right? Went, the elders went to see the wife of this crazy madman who had also uh, died. Uh, they went to see his wife and his parents and they embraced him. And they said, we forgive it all. Here they, this guy, this woman's husband, this, this, this woman's son had gone in and murdered these innocent little children. And they said, we forgive you. We forgive this offense. See that the Amish people, for whatever you have to say good or bad about them, they understand the importance of forgiveness. And so they forgave it right away. When they had the funeral, um, you know, for for the man who killed these these kids, there were more Amish people at the funeral than his own people. And so that, you know, that's what it looks like to forgive. And we, we might say, well, I could never forgive that. And I, I can't imagine being my babies, right? But see, they, they understand God's perfect will. And that's what we need to understand too. When I look at the train wreck of my life, and believe me, I, I know my story would make your toes curl. Yours would probably make mine curl too, right? But but I know when I, on the, I'm a Monday morning quarterback on this side of it. I'd look back and say, oh my goodness, look at what he did during that trial. Look what he did. Look what he taught me. Look how he refined me. Look how he grew me. And I can see the intent. The Amish people, uh, you know, you can't look on just the surface of life and think you understand God. He says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. My ways aren't your ways. And, and so we can't look at the surface of it. For whatever reason, a madman went into the Amish school and killed all those innocent little babies. But God will always be glorified if we put his will and we trust his will first. And so I, you know, I can't help but think about that when we get around uh, the Amish people. Forgive instead of seeking revenge. Who do you think you are? You're going to listen. <laughs> this scripture says it's a dreadful thing and to fall into the hands of the living God. And so when, you know, when I finally forgave the offense that I, you know, biggest offense in my life, actually, when I was a murderer in my heart, when I finally forgave, I had compassion for that person. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, they have to face God one day. It's a dreadful thing. You can't do anything, including taking a shotgun yourself and getting them out of their misery. There's nothing you can do uh, that, that, that equals the pain and agony of facing the living God. It's a dreadful thing to fall into his hands. Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Lord. We have no business out there, you know, thinking, well, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to write up a, a something in the newspaper. I'm going to go on social media and ruin their lives. You know, I, I'm going to uh, call their family member. It, it, you know, shame on any of us for thinking that. And I was there, okay, in that period of my life. Shame on us. See, it's a dreadful thing. He will balance the scales one day and vengeance is his. So nothing you could ever think about doing could could hold a candle to what that person will have to face in the, in the presence of the living God. He has very high standards, okay? Jesus says in Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So receiving mercy comes to us through our being merciful. We have to extend mercy to get mercy. You want the good stuff with Jesus? You got to put it out there, right? Is it merciful to withhold forgiveness from someone? 
Are you serious? Is it, you think that's merciful? And believe me, we don't have a right to do it. God's saying, you want my forgiveness? You better cough it up. You better let it go. You better forgive that person. And again, we have whitewashed it and held on to things. Or maybe nobody really has, uh, you know, in our presence at least spoken so boldly on the important to forget us. I don't know. Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your heavenly father will not forgive your sins. And that ought to scare the stew out of everybody. Just that one scripture. If you don't extend uh, you know, grace and mercy and forgiveness to your brother, don't look for it from me. And so when the very the very essence of our Christianity is understanding that he paid the price for a debt we could never pay. And that's the only hope we have, the only way that we have salvation. And yet we're going to sit here and try to withhold from brothers and sisters. So let's read it again. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. That is something that should keep us awake at night until we make it right. James 2.13, judgment and that's judgment by God, right, is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. So you're saying, if you don't have mercy, I can have mercy. Ooh, my judgment won't have mercy in it anywhere unless you extend mercy yourself. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So if we show mercy, our judgment will not be condemnation. It'll be mercy. One of the most beautiful uh, stories of, 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 of forgiveness and mercy that I could think of, and I shared it uh, this morning, is a story, and I'm going to give you the very condensed version of it, but um, it's about a, a, a little boy. He was like seven years old in, in Florida, and he was abducted, and he was brutally raped, and he was beaten near death, and uh, you know his kidnapper took him out to the Everglades of all places and just dumped his body, just absolutely positively sure that something, that alligator something was going to eat it. There'd be no evidence, right? But, but as God would have it, somebody found that little boy before he died. And he went into, uh, you know, of course, the hospital and he healed and he became a, a devout Christian. And when well, he's grown up and he's married, he's got a couple of kids. And, and he reads about that man was released from prison. And so he decides to look up where this man is. So apparently he went straight from prison to like a, a, a nursing facility. He was in, in, in bad way, been in there for many, many years. So this man says to his wife, I have to go see him. Can you imagine? You're seven years old. You get abducted by a stranger. You get raped. You get beaten. And you get thrown into the Everglades to die. And yet this Christian man wanted to go see the one who had done that to him. So he and his wife go in and they visit him a few times. And they're so kind. You know, they they cut his, uh, shaved him and cut his toenails and clean him up and talk to me. And every day we say, why do you do this for me? Why, you know, where did you come from? Why did you do this for me? And finally he answered the man and he said, uh, he, he shared his faith with him. But he said, I'm the little boy that you left for dad in the Everglades. And this man began to weep. And uh, actually this guy led the man to the Lord. And he and his wife took that man into their own home until he died. So don't talk to me about forgiveness, okay? I I look at that kind of thing and say, that's just a miracle. That's just a mercy. That's a, such God-like mercy that I, I, I pray I could be that way. And so, you know, it's mercy. He took that man and the man who had left him to die, seven-year-old boy. So mercy triumphs over judgment. If we show mercy, our judgment won't be condemnation. It'll be mercy. So we mercy triumphs over judgment. And that's what we need to extend. Matthew 5, 29. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. You know, for it's better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. This is not, you know, there's some radical people out there with the ears that pluck their eyes out. You know, this is not uh, a, a necessarily a, you know, uh, literal go pluck your eyes. It's basically saying, listen, you got part of you that's not right. You got part of you that's not walking with me. You got part of you that's filthy and vile, which unforgiveness is, right? It, it'd be better for you to chop something off and to live with that because you're going to go to hell because of it. So that's really what it's saying. You rot the whole body with that one thing. So we can walk around all churched out and pretty out and smile and hug our neighbors and friends and uh, people in church. But as long as we got that uh, unforgiveness in our heart, man, we can't have, again, the fullness of joy. So fruit and root, Matthew 7, 16 through 20, uh, is where Jesus says we'll be known by our fruit, right? 
So he says, you will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. So it's basically saying, listen, we can do everything. You know, we again, try to follow the rules and look good on the outside and all that. But a good tree, a good, you can't bear that kind of bad fruit. If you, you know, if you're a good tree, you can't, it's not, it's not possible. And so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and it's thrown into a fire. I don't know about you. I don't want to go to the fire. I, I want to get as refined as I can get, right? I, I want my toes stepped on. I want to be learning and growing and becoming more of what God has me every single day. So, you know, again, we have whitewashed so much from uh, in, within the churches, right? We, we, we don't talk that hellfire damnation is scary stuff. Nobody wants to hear. Well, I'd rather hear that and be confident that I'm not going to hell than to have somebody withhold it because it, it might hurt my feelings. Hell would hurt a lot of feelings, right? So every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. But the absence of good fruit in our lives, that means fire, no doubt. Bearing fruit doesn't make you a good tree. So you do see some people bear that some good fruit, right? It doesn't mean necessarily they're a good tree. A lot of people jump to the conclusion that we're somehow making ourselves into a good tree and that we can earn our salvation. It's it's, it's just called works, right? Uh, by doing good things, you know, that ain't gonna happen. A good tree bears good fruit. And so if you have fruit, you're a good one, a good tree, not the other way around. In other words, you're not just faking it until you make it, right? You're not just uh, producing good things. We're not saved by good fruit. The fruit, good fruit shows that we are a good tree of faith in Jesus Christ. So you can't fake that kind of thing. It's only a good tree that can bear that good fruit. But a tree, a good tree, it can't bear good fruit if it's got unforgiveness in there, right? It, it, or sin, or not, not trying to walk with Jesus. Forgiveness overflows. So if the forgiveness that we received at the cost of the blood of Jesus, right, is so ineffective in our hearts that we are, you know, just bent on holding or withholding forgiveness or, and holding grudges and bitterness against somebody. We're not a good tree. There's no way to put it. And we are not a good tree. We're not bearing good fruit. And the bad tree gets thrown into the fire. Right. So, it, listen, we need to focus on the cross. Never lose sight of the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did. That is the essence of, of our entire journey of faith, right? And so, you know, we can't look at that and 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 think, well, it's not a big deal. I mean, he forgave me, but, you know, he understands. He knows how I was hurt. He knows how I was wrong. I, they haven't apologized yet. Are you kidding me? That's too lame to wait. It, it'll never fly with Jesus. And so we're not a good tree if that's what it looks like. And if that's what it looks like, we don't really regard salvation and the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness we receive with a whole lot of anything. And so it really does come down to our understanding what a gift we were given. So we don't uh, cherish this forgiveness offered to us, maybe, or we don't trust in the forgiveness, maybe, I don't know, or we don't embrace and treasure the forgiveness in totality, then we're not saved. If you can't, if those things aren't true in your life, you can't be saved, right? And so we have, when we treasure, we are so grateful that, you know, he would save a wretch like me. Uh, you know, I was, I was saying this morning that the closer we draw to him, you know, we are never going to be sinless. Okay. We, that's not what, what we're trying to do. It's not possible. Jesus was the only one, but we are supposed to seek after his will. And we're supposed to attempt to be holy as he is holy. And when we love him, we want to do his will, right? When we love him, it becomes so much easier. We see that conviction right away. We want to get rid of the bad stuff. We, we want to be a good, healthy tree, bearing good, healthy fruit. We want to get rid of it. But if we don't cherish that forgiveness that, that he, he gave to us through his blood, if we don't trust in that forgiveness, you know, we listen, we're not saved. And so examine your heart as you're listening to this and pray over it, please. Uh, you know, so that we can be sure and you can be sure in your heart that, that that's where you're, you'll spend eternity with them. Matthew 7, 21 through 7, uh, 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, 
Did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So here we have people doing outward things, right? They're trying to have good works uh, that would buy them salvation. But he sees through it all. He sees your heart, right? And he saves them. They were doing big stuff. These are these are. Uh, what we would refer to as church people, right? <laughs> so they say, wait a minute, didn't we prophesy? That's a big deal, prophesy in your name. And, and didn't we cast out demons in your name? They are actively working out there the kingdom of God. So you might wonder, well, how is that possible if, if, if he didn't really know him? Well, the name of Jesus, it's Jesus that brings the power. It's not any of us, right? So you see that it says that we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name. The power of Jesus can't be squashed out just because somebody's a you know a fake or a non-believer, right? Can't be. So he says, I never knew you. I'm sure that uh, you know, this was this is one of the most frightening verses of all in the entire Bible for me. And so we need to consider it. So acknowledging uh, the Lordship, for lack of a better way of putting it, Jesus doesn't save anybody. You know, demons acknowledge Jesus. It doesn't save anybody. We show his lordship. We show that that's who he is in our lives and in our heart by doing the will of his father. Listen, we have a Bible. We read it. Are we wanting to obey it? Or, or, or have we been convinced that once saved, always saved, you don't really have to do anything. You just have to say you love him and get a bumper sticker and put a cross around your neck and say, amen. Is that what we've convinced? Because that's not true. So it's doing the will of his father. So without this evidence in our lives, uh, we are risk hearing those words. I never knew you. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> right. And so that's what we risk. Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will listen. Uh, excuse me. I will like him to a wise man who built his house on a rock and the rain descended. The flood, floods came in. The winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on a rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine, sayings of mine, and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So you know, it's it's very clear. He wants us to know the will of the Father, which comes through being in His Word. Uh, you know, listening to the Holy Spirit in our heart, and loving him with everything we've got, right? Uh, and so he wants us to do that. If that's part of the deal. You do the will of my father. You don't. What, what am I looking out for you for? And it says, you know, the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and it was a great fall. And so we have to do our very best. And again, the closer we draw to him, we're not going to do our best every time, every day, all the time. It's not going to happen. You know, I can't tell you how many times a day am I before the Lord saying, please forgive me, Lord, for that thought. Please forgive my hardened heart. Please forgive me. I want to make it right. I want to do the will of my father. And I want to hear. Uh, I don't want to hear. I never knew you. I do want to hear. Well done. Good and faithful. So it's a refining process, guys. And I think so many years has been whitewashed and left aside. And we have been deceived him to believe him as a whole simpler a much simpler process you know of love for jesus than than we thought struggling to forgive isn't what destroys us you know people say oh my gosh you know how am i going to forgive that person it's going to kill me for jesus died to cover those imperfections said, that's not what destroys us what destroys us is that place you know where we're not willing to forgive that's where i was i'm not i'm not forgiven i don't well never forgive my friends were telling me, Lynn, you got to pray for that. Nope, I'm not praying. I want him dead. You know, I refuse. Oh, my goodness. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I lived long enough to make that right. Right. And so it's when we have that place. Nope, they don't deserve my forgiveness. Sorry. God will have to understand. He forgives me of everything. And that's one. Listen, if you understand it, once you once you hear the word of God, you, you're committed. You're, you have an obligation to obey it. So what destroys us is that unsettledness really in our hearts. We're not where we're not going to forgive. And we maybe don't have any intention of forgiving. During that season of mine, I had no intention of forgiving. And, and when I did, I can't tell you the peace and the joy. And it's like my, my, my the journey of my faith just took off like a rocket. 
because that's something that could be set aside, right? And so, um, you know, what, maybe you don't have any intention or maybe you t- intend to cherish the grudge or, you know, fondle the wrong. Or they don't, they know what they did to me and, and blah, blah, blah. Maybe we just kind of like to stroke that a little bit, right? Uh, someone uh, someone did to me, what did they deal, do to you that made you feel bitter? And and maybe you say, I'm going to hold uh, uh, hold this against them the rest of their lives. Well, good for you. You're the one that's going to lose. So we have to look at our transgressions in this big, huge, massive pile where Jesus forgave them all. And listen, there's only one sin, right? All sin is equal. If you've been taught big sin, little sin, that's another lie. All sin is equal. There's only one unpardonable sin, and that's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Everything else we need to repent and change and ask for forgiveness of. It's not like he died. We can live however we want, and we never have to reconcile anything again. Of course we do. We love him. So we want to be, you know, ask for forgiveness, right? So maybe it's holding on. If we think we can be, you know, indwelt, if we can be consumed by the Holy Spirit and and uh, and not make war on that attitude, we're delusional. If, if we think that, you know, the two can't live together, darkness and light can't coexist. And so, if we think that we can have, well, I have the Holy Spirit, I'm good, but I'm not forgiving that bomb. That bomb did something bad. Bro, you're crazy. You're delusional. You're being lied to. The God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And he will settle all those accounts. Whatever anybody did wrong to you, believe me, again, you can't possibly do to them and, and inflict enough pain, uh, anything that's similar to what he did. Because again, Hebrews 10, 31 says, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So no matter what you've got going on, what your thoughts are, don't even speak those things out into your life, right? But, but whatever it is, you've got to let it go. And, and and that's when you'll really start growing. And and I some one of the uh, people in church this morning uh, said, you know, I did, when we started this, I would have thought this really isn't relative to me because I don't know of anything. But the Lord actually revealed something that she'd been harboring for a long time. So so maybe you're not maybe not feeling it this very moment. Maybe you say, no, I don't have anything. But God will show it. if you want to. If you sincerely want to know if you've got something you're harboring in your heart, he'll show it to you. You just got to ask him for it. But it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we don't need to do, uh, come up with any kind of plans or or, or 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 daydream about what we could do to this person or, or, or even give that a second thought. Because you know what? Again, the closer we draw to him, the more we see how filthy we really were. Our sins are disgusting until he died on that cross. So you realize um, you know, that you're the only difference between you and that person is you're forgiven. And so you need to forgive to be forgiven, right? And so it's an important thing. Psalm 103, 11, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. How many times have y'all heard me say, the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we are supposed to have reverence for the living God. That doesn't mean like a scared child hiding under the bed, but we should revere him. He, he, he's, listen, he's, he's a God of wrath. He's a God that's jealous. We need to revere him. So he's saying here, listen, I, when, I, when you ask me to forgive you, it's as far as the east. There's no limit to how far how I will go to forgive you. As far as the east is from the west, that's endless. That's to infinity. Right. So so when you ask, it's like it's like, uh, you know, it's done. It's, it's let loose. It's gone. You're free as soon as you ask and, and make that real in your heart. So far, he has removed our transgressions from us. So that's that's how far it is. As, as a father pities his children, you know, if you have children and, and maybe there was a time where they messed up, and they came to you crying and slobbering and tears and, you know, and they were they were scared. And they were they were they didn't know what was coming. You know how you had pity on them. You just want to scoop them up, you know, and love on them and tell them, and explain to them why what they did was wrong in a loving way. And so the Lord, he has pity on his children, you know, when we come to him in fear. So the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He knows us, right? And he remembers that we are dust. So when we go to him, it's as far as the east is from the west. And believe me, several times a day, 
I'm going to him for that very thing and 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 learning more about forgiveness you know what does it look like and again it's not uh it's not what we think it is sometimes matthew 7 13 uh is is what we should we keep focusing on as the time draws near for us and that is enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and brought us away that leads to destruction and there are many who go in and by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few that find it and this is basically saying of all the people who say they have a jesus trump card who who have been told all you need to do is you know get say you love them or you know spell jesus get a cross get a bumper sticker you're going to have been lied to that's not true so we have to go through this journey again we we won't reach perfection come on but we need to strive to be holy as he is holy. And as we learn things like this, we learn the importance, the significance, the, 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 the detriment, really, if we don't forgive. We learn the penalty for not forgiving. We're going to make it right. And that's what we're looking at here. That gate is narrow. Not everybody wants to face these things. Not everybody wants to make it right. You know, it's a lot easier just to stay in a foxhole and and listen to the lies that all you had to do was say you love them and get a bumper sticker. You can do that all you want. But there's a reason this says that narrow is the gate, right? And so I think it's more narrow than any of us ever imagined. And it's what keeps people like me. I won't shut up. I don't stop. It's it's like that watchman, right? Uh, just warning. This is the truth. This is He's the way, the truth, the life. And this is the truth. And we need to get it right. As for us at the well, we want it all. We want everything he has to give. And so we know that we need to dissect a little bit of our hearts, right? And be willing to be humble enough to say, oh my goodness, I need to get rid of this and clean my house up because I want everything the Holy Spirit has for me. And so that's it for me, folks. I'm going to open it up for you guys. You can unmute yourself. If you're still speaking to me, you can say something. Anybody? So how do you know when you have actually forgiven somebody? Because I can sit here all day long and say, yeah, I forgive so-and-so for whatever. But how will I know that I've truly forgiven them? Well, that's a good question. And I think uh, one thing that I was sharing this morning is that if you hear their uh, their name, if you remind somebody says, remember when Johnny did this, you know, if, if anything about that hurt comes up and you feel anything, you haven't forgiven it. If you keep rerunning the tape, if you have any kind of bitterness, if you were part of the wish I had, wish I'd done this one, that, you know, it's all really, um, you don't need to get um, proof from God. You get it from your own heart, your spirit. You will know you have total peace and you'll actually have compassion for that person. It's, you know, it's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So it really comes down to you, how you feel when that stuff still comes up. Mm. yeah how you feel and so uh, i would i would ask everybody even if you don't feel anything at this very moment and those of you who of you who are listening later on examine your heart because most of us have something yeah maybe it's just stuck under the bed right <laughs> but we don't want it to be between us and the living god we just don't we don't anybody else um, you know, I can keep the forgiveness fear of the Lord in my giving uh, to the extent that I understand that a reaper comes to not at the same time. So, uh, extremely important. I remember uh, years ago, I had a little bit of when I was in through wolves. I did not uh, and a of my aunt had come out, and but we had a terrible time out. And uh, my dad had to take me outside of the station, you know, we cried and then let me say, and when uh, he said, can't. And, uh, but I hadn't forgiven him for years. If I get to the point where um, oh. broken, he said, I lost, I had to forgive him. And I did that, and so uh, it's not just uh, pleasing the Lord, but it's it's out that happens in in our heart and in our spirit. So yes, it is. That is so, thank you so much for sharing that, Daryl. You're right, because that's what happened with me when I had that, you know, that really horrible uh, when I hate it. 
and I finally forgave. It wasn't instant, by the way. You guys have heard me say, remember, I'd pray, Lord, you know what, you know, I want him dead. <laughs> and I'm praying because you tell me to. So I would pray for him. Lord, you know my heart. You know I want him dead. And then I'd pray for him. And eventually I didn't say, you know, I want, you know, I want him dead. And then eventually it was a process for me. But it was like this huge weight, not just a weight, but where my journey of faith went, it went on fire after that, on fire. It took me to a whole different place. And I don't regret it because I can look back at it and say, and I can recognize it. I can recognize it. Thank you, Daryl, for sharing that. That's so powerful. You know, Heidi, another uh, thing that you just made me think of, you know, if, if somebody brings up a topic or brings up a person a lot, you know, and, and you and you might say, well, wait a minute, that sounds like you're harboring. No, 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 I forgive them. I mean, but hey, and they just keep bringing it up. Somebody brings up an X, and they won't shut up about an X. You know, <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll feel it in your spirit. You will. But you won't have to dig around for trouble. It'll be right there if you just pray that the Lord show you what it takes to um to forgive and if you have anything in your heart. That's great. Thank you for that. You're very welcome. Anything else? Okay. I think I do pretty good uh, not harboring a lot. I've had some things happen in my life too. And, you know, I learned to forgive them and move on. And But the hardest thing I have to forgive is myself. Oh, we talked about that this morning. That is so true. I'm so glad you brought that up. Yeah, because that is, that's a, that's a toughie, you know, but, but when we, when we do that, we, we say, well, I'm an idiot or I'm stupid or I should never, we're spitting in the face of the, our creator. Because we're made in the image and like this. You know, we're spitting in his face, not our face. Yeah. Like he didn't do a good enough job. Right. Like he's not good enough to see us through. But you're right. That's a toughie to forgive yourself when you screw up. It's it's really hard. But you know who wants you there? The devil wants you there. Yeah. Just keep whispering and whispering and reminding so that you'll keep trashing yourself and spitting in the face of the creator of the universe. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great way of looking at it. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me pray us out of here, guys. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, we're just so thankful, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us a word, Lord. Thank you for showing us the way. And Lord, I do believe the time draws near that, you know, whether it's just a, the time in our own lives and we'll, we'll, we'll leave this earth at, or it's a time, Lord, that you, we hear the trumpet call. We need to make it right. We need to have it right, Lord. This is serious business. And so, Lord, I pray each one of us examine our hearts for any thread there of unforgiveness toward a brother or sister or unforgiveness for someone in our past or, uh, you know, even the unforgiveness of our, our ourselves, Lord. We're just, um, we can just go to a place where it's so dark, beating ourselves up, and it really is spitting in your face. Lord, we love you. We love you. And as for me, I want everything you've got to give me. So I need to have a clean house. And so, Lord, thank you for putting this on my heart. Thank you for, for, for wor working on me before this message came out to my brothers and sisters, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for finding me to be a usable vessel to do your work, Lord. And thank you for each one here. I pray that they look deep inside their heart. And the people listening beyond, Lord, as they listen to this recording, they look deep, deep into their soul. For anything there, Lord, that they need to let go, they need to forgive someone else, not just hide it under the bed. So, Lord, we give it all to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lynn. Oh, thank you, guys. Yeah, I love you. You know where to find me. Pray about if anybody has any questions or you're dealing with something, just let me know. I'm glad to help you, okay? And we'll see you next Thanks. time. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys.